What is blockchain and what is the technology around it for the uninitiated? Um, so I, I've tried to explain blockchain in different ways over many, many, many years at this we point. We have time. <laughs> uh, and I finally come to the conclusion the best way to explain it is to talk about physics. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, specifically the speed of light. Fantastic. Um, so it takes a signal about a seventh of a second to get around the world at the speed of light. Yes. Okay. And a seventh of a second doesn't sound like very long. Um, but it's long enough that if you're using some kind of naive software for doing like video conference, people will continually talk over the end of each other's sentences and it makes speech really, really stressful. Right. Uh, and the reason you don't experience that when you're on a video call is because all the video, modern video calling clients stretch out the other person's video very, very carefully ah, okay. so that you don't start talking until they've finished. Right. And it's a whole bunch of under the hood software trickery to try and conceal that seventh of a second delay. Wow. Um, but if you, I mean, I used video conferencing systems before that stuff really worked very well. And it was constant chopping off of sentences because a seventh of a second in conversational time is much longer than you think. Mm -hmm. you, know, tick, tick, you know, it's, it's yeah, quite a while. Yeah, it's yeah. quite a while, right? Yeah. It's, it's long enough that it will mess things up. Mm. Um, on the other hand, a seventh of a second to a modern computer transaction processing system, um, like a, a high frequency trading system, will do 10 million transactions a second. Right. So now a seventh of a second is more than a million transaction desynchronization. Yeah. Um, and at that point, you have a real problem, right? right, right. You, there's no way that we can synchronize the world's computers in a single agreed state of reality because the light speed delay makes it physically impossible to do that synchronization. Wow. So if you've got a trading system in New York mm -hmm. and I've got a trading system in Beijing, right. and we connect these two trading systems, mm -hmm. the local trades, they could do 100,000 local trades in the time that it takes us to synchronize our two computers to agree who owns what. Yep. So we can't have the same things being traded on New York exchange and a Beijing exchange and just synchronize them because the nature of the light speed delay gives huge advantage to the traders that are closer to the local hub. Absolutely. Um, so how do we build a kind of integrated global system for solving problems or doing work in a position where we can't synchronize the computers? And that problem, we've, we've got lots of approximate solutions to it that have different trade-offs. One of the approximate solutions that has a, a particular set of trade-offs is blockchain. Mm -hmm. So what blockchain does is says, right, we agree the speed of light delay thing is insoluble. We're not going to attempt to do any kind of trickery around it. We're not going to fudge it or do predictive trading or whatever we're going to do. We're not going to do any of that. What we're going to do is we're going to hold the transactions back and we're going to run them in 15 second batches. Ah, uh, yes. Right? For, Bitcoin, yep. right? for yep. Bitcoin, it's 10 minutes. Right. Right. For in Ethereum, yep. 10 minutes in a block for Bitcoin, 15 seconds in a block for Ethereum. But it's long enough that all the speed of light weirdness gets dealt with because everything talks to everything in that 15 seconds. And then at the end of it, you take the previous 15 seconds of activity, you wrap it all up in a single unit, and you publish it. Right. That's what happened 15 seconds ago. Stamp. Then you do the next bunch of weirdness, and all the transactions happen, and everything talks to everything. Then you synchronize it all in that 15 seconds, and you say, boom, stamp. That's what happened in the previous 15 seconds. And these are the blocks in the blockchain. Yep. And everybody sort of thinks that this is a choice, right? That the blockchain is one of a bunch of different things you can do that will solve that problem, da 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 da, da. It's not a choice, right? The speed of light says the machines will not be synchronized. So if they're going to be interconnected, you're going to have to quantize time. Right. Time will have to be divided into lumps because we can't do it continuously because there is no continuously. Right. Um, and this was, this was the standard explanation of blockchain like 2011, 12, 13, 14. Right, everybody would talk about the PAC theorem and all the rest of that. Yeah. PAC theorem is just computer science's way of talking about the synchronization problems caused by the speed of light. So when we stopped talking about the PAC theorem, the whole speed of light explanation for why blockchain is necessary kind of dropped out of public discourse. And what we were left with was a whole bunch of basically muppetry as people tried to describe why we were doing things that way yeah. without actually talking about why we were doing things that right, way. Right, right. We're doing things that way because engineering and science leave, leave us without a choice, right. right? You either put all of the computers in the same place and you run them super fast because they're all on a, you know, kind of two and a half, you know, microsecond long cable. Sure. 
or you pack everything, you know, uh, you, you unpack everything, you spread it around the world, but you accept that there's going to be a 15 second mandatory minimum delay. The blockchain. The blockchain. And then why is that uh, different? So for instance, like in needing in general, because for me, the best way that I got into it was that I saw, like after I read the white paper and I got into Bitcoin a little early, uh, mm -hmm. not early as everyone else, but I bought one Bitcoin for a, a present to myself on Christmas for $200. So okay. I was yeah. like, okay, you know, a little, little, in. yeah, not bad. But my biggest thing was like, the crypto anarchism against like the Fed and, and all these other things. But the biggest thing was when I, when I really clued in, it was trust embedded into the system that we all are agreeing on X, whatever that X valuable is. Yep. So why is that kind of hugely needed, especially like not just for the, the speed of light, but even just in terms of um, people buying in, mm -hmm. you know, like transparency, accountability and trust. Yeah. So. I mean, the place where you really see this is if you're buying or selling anything on the internet. Right. Um, all the trading systems that we have basically push almost all of the risk of buying things online onto the sellers. Mm. Right. You buy something on Amazon, you don't like it, they give you another one. Right. right. You buy something on eBay, you don't like it, they give you another one. Even with that very strong push from the sellers, uh, sorry, from the, ven from the, the trading houses mm -hmm. to provide you with insurance, it's still possible to get scammed on Amazon. It's still well, possible to get scammed on eBay. For sure. Even with a system that tries to allocate all the risks to the sellers. Yeah. Right? And that problem is much more profound than it looks because it's breaking our ability to work with second-hand markets. Mm -hmm. And if we can't work efficiently with second-hand markets, when you no longer want something, it's going to one of three places, right? It goes to a charity shop, right? It goes to another buyer, or it goes into the trash. Right, 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 right. Right, and given the enormous overconsumption that we're doing, the fact that we've got completely broken secondary markets because neither Amazon nor eBay provides the clean system you need to do the sales, huge issues. Huge right? issues. International trade, right? You want to buy something from Brazil or Belize or Bolivia, bad enough if you're trying to do it from America or Europe. Right, that's that's hard. It's difficult. There are imports, there are tariffs, there are duties, there are and payments. Right, they get all these hoops to jump through. Yeah. But if you're trying to trade from Brazil to Belize, right, you've got terrible, terrible bureaucracy on both sides, mm -hmm. and this is also breaking south-south trade. Right, south-south trade is way harder than north-south trade because in north-south trade you've got an efficient global system on one end. And then you've got the kind of local bureaucracy on the other. When you've got local bureaucracy on both ends, practically impossible. If you, should, if you are a, an account holder of you know, a standard bank account in a second tier country, wiring money backwards and forwards from America is practical-ish. Yeah. Wiring money from other second tier countries, incredibly difficult and expensive. Right. Right. So you know, second hand markets are broken. South-South trade is broken. right? Um, individuals, right? Small business, where you've just got a single person that wants to run some kind of enterprise. Mm -hmm. International banking fees are enormous. Oh, absolutely. The bureaucracy around KYC is enormous. Mm -hmm. It's practically impossible to get through all the bureaucratic hoops to do international business unless you're quite large. Mm -hmm. It's really difficult, right? So, you know, you can't get efficiency in a global system without working second-hand markets, without working south-south trade, and without the ability for individuals to trade globally. Right, right. All of those are problems caused by a legacy financial architecture, which was never designed to solve those problems. Right. The legacy financial architecture, now, here we're gonna go, this is gonna be a little rough, right? Okay. What was the legacy financial architecture designed to do? Um, just a, a, a mass capital? I mean, I'm assuming. Uh huh. But it's so worse. It's worse than that. Okay. Okay. <laughs> it's so much worse than that. <laughs> more right? cynical. Give it to me. Oh yes. yeah. <laughs> cynical. Worse, right? <laughs> right. Well, I mean, the legacy financial architecture was built during the golden age of colonialism. Oh, of of course, of course. Right. And so exploitation, etc. It's made for right invading a country, setting up a banking infrastructure, and then stealing everything which isn't nailed down. Right? Yeah. And that's what the banking system was made to do. The banking system was there as the rail which ran right beside the gunboat diplomacy and right beside the Banana Republic. Right. Do you, so do you remember the term Banana Republic? Of course, yeah. Right? I mean, now it's getting thrown around way more in the United States than, than right. when I was growing up. <laughs> 
but you know, literally countries where you know Dole or one of the other fruit companies would team up with the CIA, and they would turn some place into a plantation, yeah. right? Flip over to the local government, install somebody that was friendly to the fruit company, depress wages, and kill the tariff structure, and and just you know loot these places. Yeah, I've read a book called from John Perkins, uh, Confessions of a New Economic Hitman. And that was literally not just dull. I mean, they, they got better and more efficient in their processes that like, basically they would go down to a country and just depending on what they had, it would be either, you know, hey, we're gonna build all these malls and these markets and all these Americanized things or the Western things. And then basically if, uh, once they knew that they were gonna default on their loans, they're like, no problem, no problem. We don't need the capital actually, but we're gonna take your resources and then we're gonna install a military base here, just so, just so we're clear. And then that's what happened, you know, in, in around the world. Yep. Um, so then let's, let's talk about the trade-offs then of blockchain. Cause I know you mm. mentioned like, I don't wanna to get too much in that blockchain is the entire, you know, um, magic pill that is gonna fix everything, but what are some of the trade-offs of blockchain? Well, so let's talk about it in terms of purpose. Right? Yes, okay, perfect. The, our good friend, the internet, Mm -hmm. was basically designed for a robust point-to-point -point communication. Yes. Right? Originally, it was designed for keeping computers working during a nuclear war. Ambitious. Um, but, you know, it became big because of email, mm. right? You could send a message from one person to, with an email address to another person with an email address across the world for free, anytime you like, and it worked. Right. It was pretty reliable. So think of that paradigmatically, point-to-point -point communication between the individuals, which is free and reliable, versus the legacy banking infrastructure, which was intended to basically pump resources from poor countries to rich countries at gunpoint. Right, right. Right? Yeah. Two different structures that work in two different ways. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and, and this is a super controversial thing to say, but we are largely over colonialism, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, there are a couple of billion people that are still being squeezed super hard by yeah. it. But by the time you've got a country as large and powerful as China, you know, standing up and just being like, you know, you guys used to kind of squash us into a corner and we're sort of done with that now. Yeah, <laughs> and we're now we're gonna start put boxing right. out. You know? <laughs> like and you know, you guys kind of look like a bunch of ignorant children compared to us. <laughs> like we did one child family at the same time that you invented the SUV which one of us should run the world in future, right. right? And then now with the whole social credit system, things right. like that, yeah. You know, they're modernizing, yeah. right? But I mean, they're modernizing in a mode where, and I, I cannot make this too clear, you know, the Chinese power structure is 4,000 years of continuous administration. Right, 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 right. right. They haven't Going had a serious ancient. glitch in their ability to fill in forms and push government processes in four millennia, mm -hmm. right? You know what was happening in Europe four millennia ago, right? I mean, we're talking about barbarian tribes fighting over goats, right. right? And frankly, Europe was still barbarian tribes fighting over goats until like 1750 in Scotland, right. right? You know, we are not a civilization compared to the Chinese. We are, you know, if you, if you want to zoom back and think of world history, you know, the barbarians that sacked Rome. Yes, the Gauls. Right? Or the Gauls, right? Yeah, right? Yeah. That's us compared to the Chinese. Mm. Right, four thousand years of continuous civilization. You get a military breakthrough in Europe and America, and the white folks become really good at war. Right. They turn up, they sack India, they sack China. Right, the old cultures take a couple of centuries to recover from this, and gradually they get back on their feet. Like, okay, we're not doing that again. Right. right, but that is the relationship between the old cultures and Europe and America. Right. right, the European, European and American business model is directly descended from the Vikings. Mm. Right, you know, get on boats, kill people, and take their stuff. Yeah, and just set up shop. <laughs> right, that's the Viking business model. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, exactly yeah. what the Vikings did. Right, right. The Vikings would come to trade, and if there was nothing that you were willing to sell them at a price they liked, then they would move into raid mode. Right, right, and, and just take over. And yeah. just take over. And yeah. this was that. That was how the Vikings operated. Right, Vikings ran places as far away as the south of Spain, because if you had a port, the Vikings would arrive on a boat armed, come in, s install themselves as the government, and then operate a trade network with the other Vikings. Right. And that structure rolls directly on to capitalism. Mm, that's so interesting. Uninterrupted. Right. 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 And you know who who are the people that basically run that structure? Right. It's the British, 
the British were invaded by the Vikings in 1066. Yeah. Right? The, the royal... The conquest, right? The or, Norman yeah, conquest. Norman right? conquest, yeah. So the, I remember that date. Right? <laughs> so the <laughs> Normans are Vikings. Right, 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 right. Right? So the, Viking, the Vikings capture the British crown, run Britain, Britain as a Viking vassal state where the Vikings are the upper classes and the Saxons are the lower classes, right? And that structure is directly exported onto the rest of the world, and we call it colonialism. Yeah, totally. Blonde-haired, blue-eyed, armed guys get off a boat and steal your stuff. Right. And you have to zoom back a long way and gloss over all of the detail to get that. You know, you, it's a very blurry model of history, but it's an accurate blurry model of history. Right. right. So we're now in a position where none of the classic colonial powers have enough firepower to make that stick anymore. Mm. Right? We're out of the colonial phase of history because the West is not strong enough to be colonial anymore. Lost in Afghanistan, lost in Iraq, you know, pretty much all continues the military... Continues to lose, actually. Continues yeah. to lose, right? <laughs> like all 19 of, years in. <laughs> all of the military adventurism turns out to be disastrous mm -hmm. because the, the power gradient is no longer what it once was. Right. And once you begin to accept that the power gradient... You know, an M16 is not that different from an AK-47. Right? right, an American kid f from you know Iowa or Wisconsin is not that much different from some kid from you know Iraq bordering Kurdistan. Absolutely, and yeah. it turns out when you put them in a city and you have them fight with each other, the kill ratio is nothing like what it was in like eighteen seventy when it was Indians. Right, right. you see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So the, the colonial business model was basically out of fight, right? But the legacy financial system is so hide bound by regulation. Right? It's so baked into established norms and things like accounting practices and reporting practices and all the rest of that stuff that the legacy financial system is basically unable to adapt to the end of colonialism. Right. Right? All of that massive financial infrastructure which is designed to put capital into poor countries to run an extractive economy, none of that stuff is required anymore. Right. Right? The balance of power has shifted. You're beginning to see a global economy which is vastly less unfair than it was, which is not the same thing as saying that it's fair, right. but it used to be so much worse than this. And so moving on from Bitcoin, um, in 2015, you helped coordinate uh, Ethereum, which is another cryptocurrency, uh, to the valuate or the launch, and it was valued at $70 you know, billion. So can you talk about that experience and then thoughts on Ethereum now? I know that Materium, we're going to talk about that, that's based on the Ethereum protocol, but mm -hmm. what was that kind of experience like for the last you know, seven years? Um, so I had been kind of pattering around the corners of kind of defense academia, disaster mm -hmm. relief, infrastructure, charities, you know, water, sanitation kind of space for many years at that point. And uh, I was going broke, right? The economy was going to hell. All the little niches I'd been occupying were kind of drying up. The work mm -hmm. just wasn't coming in. Um, and I felt like, you know, I should go and get a job in tech, right? right? You know, I'm a programmer, I'm an architect, I can do this stuff, right? I'd been watching Bitcoin very carefully, um, but I knew that a currency alone wasn't enough. We needed the rest of the financial infrastructure. We needed the ability to build other financial infra instruments. We needed the ability to build structure. And you can't do that with just a payment rail. Right. Uh, and then I hear, hear the term smart contracts coming up again. Mm -hmm. And smart contracts were like the high watermark of cryptography in the first wave. Right. It was like, oh yes, one day there will be a smart contract. And so I hear this and I'm like, okay, that's my ship. So I go over and I'm just like, hey, I can do stuff, what do you need? And there was a, a decision about was I going to go on the technical side or was I going to go on the comms side? Yes, yes, yes. Could have gone either way. Did I want to be a programmer or did I want to be doing comms? So the comms team was in London and I was already in London and the tech was in Berlin. So I decided that I was going to stay in London and do the comms thing. Uh, and the comms thing was really building on top of a whole bunch of experience that I'd had about trying to communicate complex systems stuff to a general public. Mm -hmm. So I get well dug in on the comm side of Ethereum, spend a bunch of time on that, and then as we get closer to launch, you know, there's this sense of like, um, yeah, we also need some kind of project management pairs of hands. Right. And I was probably 15 or 20 years older than almost everybody on the team. Right, right. You know, because I mean, they were I all be, young. V Vitalik was what, 23? Uh, Vitalik was like 20. Okay, but even, even younger. I yeah. mean, he's like 23 now. Now? Right? <laughs> yeah. he was. He was young, um, and a lot of the other people were too. So 
you know, that's not a bad position to be doing project management from right. because you've seen a lot of stuff go wrong over the years and you tend to flap less. Um, so I just kind of sat in the middle of it and you know, just held together some of the processes and just helped the thing along and then we launched. Right. Uh, and then not much happened for a year. Um, I went to Consensus Systems in New York, worked yep. for Joe Luber for a while, uh, and then Ether went through the freaking roof. Oh, yeah. um, and I had taken legal advice at the Dow crisis. Mm. So I'm like, okay, I don't really understand what just happened there, but I have a bad feeling about this. And I sat down with some lawyers in London, and they said, Vinay, have you heard of a thing called securities fraud? Mm. And I'm like, pardon? They're like, you're basically acting as one of the front men for something that has just released an unlicensed security to people including the American public. Mm -hmm. You kind of have two choices here. You could, you know, at least you weren't there for the crowd sale, right? You joined after the crowd sale was over. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Well, that will help, but you can't be in a position where you're going to massively profit from this at the same time as you're selling it to people. Ah, uh, of course, the conflict right? of interest. Conflict of interest, right? Yeah. So you can either divest or you can move to a jurisdiction without an extradition treaty. And I'm like, you what? That's going to cost me tens of millions of dollars. These are your choices. Mm. So I divested. Yeah. Really early on in the process. And that decision directly leads to Materium. Right. Because, you know, I was probably the only person in that game, other than people like Lubin who had come out of the financial services industry, they even understood that what we were doing might be of interest to regulators. Right. Right. And the people that were really old school financial services types were like, you know, new financial products always break the law. And it, as long as it doesn't turn out to be fraud, what happens is that the regulators will come along and grandfather in like, yeah, yeah, okay, fine. We've got to update the law. Right, right. It's good enough for the rest of the people. It's but they valuable. Were always used to they were always used to taking that risk. Because it turns out in financial services, all of the money is made doing things which are currently illegal. And then you either go to jail or the regulators say, actually, that wasn't fraudulent and we need to update the regulations because that's just business. Right, right. Um, but I looked at the situation and was just like, you know, I've seen several rounds of the crypto wars. We've lost every round. I'm not going to stick my neck out on that chopping block this time. Right. Not even for tens of millions of dollars. Right. Uh, and with hindsight, was that the right thing to do? Probably not. Or well, at least financially, but I mean, with Ethereum's. But we'll see what happens after the SEC works its way through the ICO crowds. Very right? true. Very you know, true. It's, it's a very tricky frontier, mm -hmm. right? Because most of my coworkers walked out set for life, right? And I walked out with enough money to start a company. Yeah. Right? And th that trade off and the positioning relative to the regulators and the balancing of it, you know, it's that thing where. I'm looking for a very specific shade of meaning here. Um, having seen the crypto revolution crash and burn a couple of times, I wanted to be in a position where I could walk out of the wreckage and not be screwed. A little resiliency. Right? Yeah. Uh, and depending on which way the regime in Washington decides that they're going to shut down, and I stress that very strongly, depending on what way the regime in Washington decides they're going to shut down, the anonymous financial system will affect whether or not the people that walked out of these systems with a lot of money keep it or wind up having to return it to the original investors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? right? Because there's no way that the security bureaucracy in Washington is going to allow a parallel anonymous financial system to run alongside of the real financial system. Right. right? This is back to this question of like, hey, it's like email for money versus, hey, we're going to tear down the state. If you announce that you're going to tear down the state and then you fail to tear down the state, the state will tear you down. Absolutely. <laughs> and that's where all this stuff is, right? Yeah. All that stuff about you know Zuckerberg getting whacked on the nose and told to hand over the keys to Washington, exactly the same keys that are protecting your messaging that Washington wants Facebook to hand over, those are also the keys that are protecting your Bitcoin. Yeah. So it's yeah. only a matter of time until Washington comes from the Bitcoin keys as well. Yeah. Right? And you know, this is the hard, hard, hard truth, which is that if you announce that you're revolutionaries and then you fail, you will get squashed. Yeah. And what I'm attempting- Because you, you basically draw attention to yourself. You, yeah. You've set the table stakes, yeah. Yeah. right? Yeah. You know, like we're, we're in to win it, right? <laughs> it's war, well, okay, fine, <laughs> right? Um, 
And so, you know, we're at risk of losing so much of the technological progress that's been made in these domains because of this, you know, shallow libertarian Ayn Rand crap. Right. Right? You know, like, we do need a way of synchronizing the world's computers, or we cannot do south-south trade, we cannot build efficient second-hand markets, right? We, we can't make the internet carry financial services stuff unless we figure out how to do this stuff properly, totally. right? But because of this, you know, anti-state oppositional positioning that was so much of the early branding of Bitcoin, you know, of course the feds will eventually take notice of that. Sure. Um, so I kind of feel like what I'm doing right now is fighting a bit of a rear guard action to try and cleanly separate out the real utility of these technologies from the naive political branding around them. Right. You know, I'm really kind of just working a chisel along that line. Um, because uh, a global blockchain solution for carbon management, it's all the same technologies, mm -hmm. right? It solves an enormous global problem that cannot be solved with existing financial architecture. Mm -hmm. Right, and it's it's a very blockchain shaped problem. Right? right, so I can easily imagine that 15 years from now, half of the global economy runs on a carbon accounting system that runs on a thing which looks like a blockchain. Right, I can easily see that from here. Right, but the original libertarian vision of Bitcoin has to die to make room for something that actually works.